Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and the power is still out. And I'm literally running these off, these lights from whatever I can find. Uh, like I've even got one of these things here I've been winding up, and it doesn't work very well. Whoa, yes, dark, scary Halloween. No, um, <laughs> never mind. So, I want to talk about the X-37B, which just touched down after a record mission in space. Since the space shuttle stopped flying, the X-37B, the mysterious X-37B, has kept the dream of space planes literally aloft. It's also known as the Orbit Test Vehicle. And the design has flown five missions in the last 10 years, and that may not seem a lot, but yet yeah, this last mission was over two years long. That's more than twice the career, the entire flight career of the Space Shuttle at uh, Discovery, I think, right? 360 days or something, cumulative time over all its missions. So these are long duration missions. Now, the, the origin of the X-37 goes back to the late 1990s. The, again, it was you know, another lighter, reusable space plane concept that NASA worked with Boeing and the Air Force to develop. Initially, the first thing they built was an X-37. While specking this out, they realized that they wanted to build a smaller test vehicle for aerodynamics and new technologies. So the X-40 was the first vehicle built as part of this program. It was about 20% smaller. It, didn't, it wasn't obviously orbit capable, but it did have the correct aerodynamics. It had the new avionics, the um, flight control systems. It had the, the calculated air data system, which uh, is their mechanism for actually determining airspeed and velocity without needing to have uh, little pressure pitot tubes that stick out into the airstream. That's something you don't want to do uh, when you're re-entering from space. Otherwise, it will get destroyed by the re-entry heating. So the early flights of the X-40 took place using a helicopter to lift the vehicle up to 15,000 feet, whereby it would then fall and navigate towards the runway. Uh, the very first flight was uh, in 1998, and it flew down and it landed basically right in the center of the runway, which was fantastic. It would fly a couple more flights. Now, a couple of years later, the Air Force dropped out. It decided it wasn't interested in space planes again for some reason but NASA then continued on its own and it of course was working towards now the full-scale X-37 and they had a plan to have two vehicles first would be an approach and landing test vehicle and then they would have the proper vehicle which would do all the orbital tests about 2003 though with uh, obviously more drama at NASA and problems with the space program it was reviewed, the project was decided to be sort of out of line with NASA's long-term exploration goals, and they were told to wind up the project. Uh, and at that point, they had began construction, so they were going to see out at least the testing of this vehicle they'd paid for. Boeing worked with the Department of Defense and said, uh, hey, maybe you want to work on this a little. So NASA began working with the Department of Defense on the X-37, which would do the approach tests. So NASA's X-37 would see its first flight in 2005, carried under the White Knight, the carrier aircraft that would take the Spaceship One vehicle to its launch altitude, where it would perform its prize-winning flights. Uh, so it did several captive carry tests, and in 2006, they finally got to drop it and test it. And the thing flew beautifully under a fully autonomous control. It aimed for the runway, put itself down gently on the center of the runway, and ran off the end where it sustained some minor damage. But not to be too perturbed by this, they did repair it, went back and did another couple of test flights, and these were flawless. And so, having proved the technology, the program wound up. But two months after that, the Air Force, finally having seen the error of their ways, announced that they would be building the X-37B, a fully capable orbit vehicle. And at that point, everything went quiet because it was a super classified Department of Defense project. So let's look at the design. 
The front off actually looks a lot like a miniature space shuttle with the classic lifting body nose and the delta wings and the ailerons. But then at the rear, it extends back a whole lot further, it widens out, and instead of a single tail, you have this V-shaped tail with a pair of rudder vators that are ru rudders that are also elevators. So the whole vehicle is about 10 meters long, uh, about four and a half meters wide, with a total mass of about five tons. For manoeuvring in space, there's a set of con uh, reaction control thrusters fore and aft, all integrated neatly into the surface, and there's a single large engine at the rear. Now, it's unusual for this because the a single engine isn't actually square on the rear, it's offset to the right a little, uh, but it does of course still aim through the centre of the mass. The original NASA design called for a pair of engines, which would be using uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and JP8, which is another variety of kerosene. The Air Force version supposedly uses monomethyl hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide, and that's why after it lands, the first people that approach it are wearing fully self-contained life support suits, because of course, hydrazine is scary stuff. As far as I know, the actual engine hasn't been revealed, but it's probably a pressure-fed system that gets, you know, maybe about 700 to 900 newtons of thrust. As an autonomous vehicle, there's no cockpits or windows or anything like that for people inside, but there is a payload bay door that's a couple of meters long. And we, while we've never seen any photos of the bay open, we do know that the doors have radiators integrated them into them, just like the space shuttle. However, unlike the space shuttle, when the door opens, there's also a solar panel array that deploys out of this and is visible in orbit. In fact, Ralph Vanderberg did manage to take a photo of this thing in orbit with the solar panel deployed. So the V-shaped tail with the rudder vators was chosen over a standard vertical tail design because they wanted it to be small enough to fit inside the space shuttle payload bay. That was the original plan. Of course, by 2003, this was looking like a bad idea and they wanted to switch it over to an expendable launch vehicle. Initially, I think the plan was to use a Delta II with the aircraft or the vehicle not inside any fairing, but there was a lot of concerns about how the um, control surfaces and the wings would affect the stability of the rocket, so they decided to instead stick it inside a payload fairing. That probably meant that they shifted it to the Delta IV, but ultimately it launched on the cheaper Atlas V. And of course, Later, more recently, it launched on SpaceX's Falcon 9. Those rudder vators were pretty innovative too. They were made of reinforced carbon-carbon, and unlike the Space Shuttle where they had carbon-carbon at the front of the wings, there's no airframe inside of these. These entirely carry their own structural loads. Um, the control surfaces are all electromechanically activated. That means the rudders, the um, the elevons, body flaps, the air brake, there's no hydraulics or anything in there. And so that makes this the first orbital vehicle to use entirely electrically active, actuated control surfaces. So, so far there have been five flights with this vehicle and we know that there's two separate vehicles that have been identified due to subtle differences in their uh, hardware on landing and recovery. And as for those mysterious payloads, there are a lot of speculations about it being a highly maneuverable uh, reconnaissance platform or something that can carry weapons. I think these are silly. I mean, if as a reconnaissance platform, it doesn't really make sense because it's too small, but there is likely that they are testing sensor hardware on it. Um, equally, it certainly doesn't make sense as a weapon system, at least as, as far as I can tell. No, I think what they're doing is they are just testing hardware for future satellites. It provides a platform for them to put stuff in space for a long time so they can test electronics, sensors, uh, propulsion, thermal control systems, anything. And they can then return it to Earth so they can really assess how it performed in space and how it degraded over time. NASA does this all the time on the space station, but of course the space station is an international project with people from all over the world. And the Department of Defense no doubt would prefer to keep their new special high-tech toys away from any prying eyes that are not classified you know, US citizens. So there have been a few experiments which have been clearly identified. 
On OTV4, they had a material science experiment where they were essentially exposing new experimental materials to space to see how they performed, um, you know, just to see how they degrade over time. On the same mission, they were also testing a new Hall effect thruster, an ion thruster, which is going to be flown or is being flown on the new AEHF communication satellites. And in some of the recovery photos, you can actually see this ion engine on the back. Remember how I said one the engine was offset to the right? Well, this is on the left side, so it kind of makes sense um, as to, or it might explain why the engine is offset like that, because it gives you a place to test another engine. On this flight, it's confirmed that they were testing an oscillating heat pipe, a new mechanism for pumping heat around a spacecraft, which is, of course, critically important in spacecraft management, which is presumably, you know, this oscillating heat pipe is supposedly way better than the garden variety heat pipes that we use in, to cool our computers all the time. They did also say that they launched a number of small satellites. And this is sort of controversial because there's been no official notification to the UN as to these satellites being launched, which is what the US is supposed to do. Granted, there are many countries that launch satellites and then don't notify the UN, but the US is kind of supposed to, you know, be the one that respects these things and sets the standard for everyone else. So you can see why that's a little controversial. The spacecraft have also tested new thermal uh, protection systems. Uh, you could test thermal protection systems on the space shuttle, but they generally didn't like you fooling around with anything that was mission critical like that. So it was very hard to get anything tested. In this one, yeah, they tested a new system called Tough Rock, which is more or less a new high-tech way of attaching the outer thermal tiles to the inner material and making them hold on more securely. So uh, yeah, there's been apparently a few variations on that being tested. So anyway, for now, this X-37B is returning to the Space Shuttle Processing Facility that it now calls home. And we expect another flight of one of these vehicles next year on an Atlas V. And I will be surprised if I hear anything else about this thing, because of course everything is super secret. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.